This is a lecture for my administrative law class. We're talking about the non-delegation doctrine, which sounds really boring. Um, this is a recent US Supreme Court case though from 2019, where they were discussing whether the sex offender registry requirement and the statute about, that requires um, or creates the sex offender registry violates the non-delegation doctrine. So let's take a look at our slides. So the case, the case name is Gundy versus United States. Again, this is from 2019, and we're talking about the non-delegation doctrine and the sex offender registry. And so let's talk about the statute here, and because the non-delegation doctrine is always about a statute. Oh, think of it as we're almost always going to be talking about a statute with the possible exception of a few cases where uh, the doctrine could be applied to privatization and agency contracting out to private parties. But here we're talking about the Sex Offender Registration and Notification Act or SORNA. So always ask yourself when you're dealing with non-delegation cases, what is the actual statute that's um, being challenged? Because we're typically not challenging an agency action. We're saying that the whole statute is constitutionally defective. And the bottom line here, to, I don't want to keep you in suspense, is the U.S. Supreme Court held that this does not violate the non-delegation doctrine. So why did anybody think it did? Well, the SORNA statute um, allows the attorney general to decide if and when and how the registration requirement apl will, applies retroactively to those convicted before the enactment of the statute. And so we have this issue, right, of people who were convicted or pled guilty in most cases to some sort of um, uh, sex crime. It could be a sexual assault or a rape, but it could be something like indecent exposure um, or, or something like that. And um, a long time ago, they served their time. They're out of jail. Do they now have to register as a sex offender if the sex offender um, a registry was created after they committed their crime. Now, I want to say something about this uh, uh, so that my students aren't confused. There's plenty of things that are controversial or policy concerns about the sex offender registry, right? So we have this concern that people have already been sentenced to a term of punishment, maybe a, a, a prison sentence or parole or something like that. They served their time, they paid their debts to society, and, um, and now maybe we're punishing them again for the same crime, which, as you can imagine, has raised concerns about double jeopardy. And why? Because they have to register and they're going to be listed as a sex offender, registered sex offender. This is public information and there's a social stigma with being a registered sex offender. And it can actually have legal consequences about um, what, where you're allowed to work jobs you're simply not eligible for, where you're allowed to live, whether you can live near an elementary school and things like that. Um, it could affect your family relationships and friendships and dating life and all sorts of things. So there's a lot of consequences with it being a registered sex offender. And so there's a lot of policy concerns about this. And the other issue that we have going on with this is that there's a lot of times, remember that this is going to cover a wide range of offenses. Um, everything from heinous crimes that are sexual assaults, ser serial rapists and things like that, who maybe do pose a real danger to society and pedophiles and so forth to things that you might think of as rather minor infractions or um, it don't carry the same sort of social stigma in our society, it might be a misdemeanor offense or something like that. And, but now the person is, um, as part of the deal, they fall under the statute or the attorney general's discretion in, um, for a sex offender reg registry and registering for that. Also keep in mind that this becomes a, a policy concern when people are, you have defendants and maybe it's the first time they've been arrested and so they're offered a pretty lenient plea bargain with no jail time or they have to go on, uh, they're gonna be on probation or something like that, but they have to register as a sex offender. And maybe some of those people who are pleading guilty to avoid a trial or avoid jail time or a prolonged jail sentence 
aren't really aware of or thinking about the long-term consequences it's going to have for the rest of their lives to be a registered sex offender. So all of that, there's plenty to hate about the sex offender registry. There's also obviously reasons that we have it, but none of that was really the issue in the case. The issue in the case is whether the attorney general should just get to decide which categories of criminals or, or, or people who are convicted were going to um, make register if it was before the statute was passed. And that's a certain amount of discretion. That's a delegation from Congress to the attorney general to kind of fill in the gaps and make the rules. And that's why it's a non-delegation issue. Okay, let's go back to the slides and talk about why this matters for um, sort of our, our trajectory of non-delegation jurisprudence. This case was closely watched because it was decided during a period when we had a vacancy on the U.S. Supreme Court. And there were only um, eight justices on the court or a four to four split. And the liberal, this has become a liberal versus conservative issue, whether we love or hate the non-delegation doctrine for um, liberals, they see this as an artifact, the non-delegation doctrine is kind of an artifact of the Lochner era before the New Deal. And in a modern society, we need um, a complex government. We need government agencies and Congress to pass statutes and create government entities that can address serious social problems, compl complicated social problems, and hire a lot of experts and and, and have um, be very specialized in tailoring regulations and enforcement actions to produce the best result. On the other hand, for people who are just uh, who are conservative and think we have too much regulation and it's killing business and uh, um, restraining our freedoms and so forth, they see the conservatives now uh, tend to see the non-delegation doctrine as a tool to rein in the federal bureaucracy. But remember, this is a drastic remedy. We're not just telling agencies, by the way, you can't do that. We're telling agencies, by the way, you can't exist. Your statute is invalid. Congress has to go back and um, redo it and uh, spell out a lot more of the decisions themselves instead of delegating some discretion to you in your expertise. And so keep that in mind. Now, what happened on this court uh, uh, in this case is we had four liberal justices, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was still on the court when this was decided, and they decided that there was no non-delegation problem here, and it this upheld the statute. Justice Alito actually concurred in that, even though he wants to revive the non-delegation doctrine, but this wasn't the right case to do it, he felt. And if you think about it, that makes sense, right? There's something to this. The, the this is not the typical statute that we think of when we think of a non-delegation problem um, where the attorney general is deciding um, how we're going to keep tabs on certain types of con people convicted of crimes. That right? That's a, it's a, a delegation to one individual, and it's clearly within the kind of criminal law enforcement um, gambit of the AG's office or the Department of Justice. And so uh, there are some people who are concerned about uh, um, overregulation, but what they're really thinking about uh, is regulatory costs on American businesses, right? And, um, and workers and so forth and that make it, um, uh, that hurt jobs and hurt the stock market and, and uh, suppress revenue and make, have people move their factories overseas and things like that. And this case has nothing to do with those things. So Justice Alito wrote a concurrence to say, yeah, yeah, this statute isn't the right one to do it, but I'm looking for a good opportunity to kind of reinvoke or revive the non-delegation doctrine. And I want to do that sometime soon. Now, the, the three other conservative justices on the court at the time said, actually, we'll take this opportunity to revisit or revive the non-delegation doctrine and maybe strike down the statute. And so if we can strike, if we can use this one, then it creates precedent for the next time we have one that's really the core of the concern, which is these um, agencies like the, uh, um, uh, that regulate industries, right? And they create a lot of compliance costs for businesses and so forth. And so they were going to use this as a way to kind of start reining in the federal bureaucracy and in a sense reigning in Congress and the size of the government. So we had a close split and the takeaway for my students from this is this issue is not going away, right? We have uh, 
four justices on the Supreme Court, and and it may soon be five at the time I'm recording this, the um, who are looking for a case to kind of revive the pre-New Deal or Lochner era doc non-delegation doctrine, a sort of very robust non-delegation doctrine that could be used to invalidate a lot of our federal statutes that have created and empowered um, federal regulatory agencies. So kind of stay tuned because we're gonna see more of these cases in the coming years going up to the Supreme Court. And something like the non-delegation doctrine sounds like a very abstract, boring thing, but the consequences of invoking it and invalidating a statute could be really far reaching and have a lot of effect on our government and our regulatory state. Okay, quick review question uh, for my students, just to make sure you're paying attention. What was the non-delegation concern with the sex offender registry statute in Gundy? A, registration as a sex offender imposes a permanent stigma on individuals who have already completed the statutory sentence for the crime and punishes them again for the same past action is that what Gundy was about or is it about B? The statute gives an official in the executive branch discretion to decide how and when to apply the registration requirement to those who committed their crimes before Congress enacted it. So hopefully you know the answer to this. This was supposed to be an easy question. If you aren't really sure, you really should go watch this video again um, and to make sure that you're clear on this and kind of clear on the non-delegation doctrine. Okay, that concludes our lecture uh, on Gundy versus the United States.